In this video lecture, we're going to start talking about some different methods of physical control that are typically used. So we'll talk about these first, and then we'll get into chemicals, which are things you're more familiar with, like disinfectants and antiseptics, and how those work to help us control microorganisms. All right, so in the last video clip, we talked about the, the cellular targets for uh, many control methods, and we mentioned proteins. You know, very often it's the proteins that are impacted in some way. And this is a pretty good little diagram from your book because it is showing you uh, how different control agents can impact proteins. So remember, a protein has to be fold up, folded up into its nice little perfect three-dimensional shape in order for it to work. And more specifically here, we're looking at a protein enzyme. And you've learned plenty about how important enzymes are. And um, remember that enzymes have substrates that bind to them, and then the enzyme changes those and makes the product or products. So you got to have that 3D shape there in order for enzymes to be able to bind to their substrates. And for other proteins, their 3D shapes are going to be important for their functions as well. So some control agents cause complete denaturation. So the 3D structure unravels. Uh, some may sim simply alter the shape. So if you alter the shape, the protein's still not going to be able to do its job. And then some control agents will block the active sites of enzymes. So you've got the little yellow circles there are supposed to be the chemical agent, and it's attaching to enzymes and blocking them from being able to bind their substrate. So those are just some different ways that proteins can be impacted through control methods. All right, now physical, what do we mean by physical methods of controlling microbes? So we're going to talk about six different types, uh, extreme heat and cold, desiccation or drying, uh, filtration, osmotic pressure, and then radiation. And the ones that we'll mainly focus in on are going to be associated with temperature up here, uh, extreme heat especially. Lots of different methods that are used for controlling microbes physically. Well, let's talk a little bit about heat, moist heat versus dry heat. Now think about this, uh, think about in your, you know, which of these would work faster, which one is going to be more efficient. Now think about in your, at home, in your kitchen. If you, would something heat up faster if you stuck it into a pot of boiling water? Or would it heat up faster if you stuck it in, into an oven at the exact same temperature as the boiling water? So boiling water has a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit. So which of those things would work faster? And hopefully you're thinking yeah, things heat up faster in a liquid, in water, even if it's at the same temperature as a, as a dry environment. And that's because that is true. Moist heat or, or water itself uh, conducts heat very well. It transfers heat very well. So if you stick something into a moist, wet environment, those hotter temperatures are going to transfer into that substance much faster than those hotter temperatures would transfer into something from the air. So moist heat works much faster than dry heat. So here this table from your textbook is showing a comparison of the effectiveness of moist heat versus dry heat at similar temperatures and how long it would take to sterilize something. So moist heat at 121 Celsius takes about 15 minutes to sterilize. And if you just go up to 134 Celsius, you're down to only three minutes necessary to achieve sterilization. But look over here for dry heat. So 121 degrees Celsius dry heat, and that's about 256 Fahrenheit, if I recall correctly. 600 minutes would take 10 hours. So if you took something and put it in an oven that was sitting at about 250, it's going to take 10 hours before you could feel confident that whatever you put in there was completely sterilized. All right, so moist heat, though, only 15 minutes. So it's a huge difference that moisture plays a huge role in how quickly those hot temperatures get transferred into, into uh, a substance. And also, you know, there are other reasons as well. Proteins clump and denature faster with, with the moisture around. Um, interestingly, if you put something, expose it to dry heat, the moisture leaves the, the cells that you're trying to kill, and that dehydration can actually stabilize proteins and kind of send the cells into a state of suspended animation for a while. 
So that's kind of interesting as well. So generally, moist heat's going to be better than dry heat. But you got to think about this. Remember, you can't uh, you, you can't expose everything to moist heat. Some things are sensitive to moisture, but maybe you can use the dry heat instead because there are always going to be some things that you can treat with one method that, that can't be treated in another way. All right, another uh, term that, that your textbook mentions and can come up, thermal death time. All right, thermal death time. How long does it take at a particular temperature to kill all test microbes, all microbes that are being tested? That's called your TDT or thermal death time. Oh, by the way, canned goods, your textbook mentions this as well. Uh, when items go through a canning process, if you want to sterilize the canned goods inside the can, they've got to be exposed to 121 Celsius for about 30 minutes to make sure that everything inside the can is sterilized. That's why those canned vegetables are kind of mushy. They've been cooked inside the can to try to get rid of any microorganisms that are present. So what are some moist heat methods? Autoclaving. You've heard about autoclaving already in some of your virtual labs, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more shortly about how autoclaves work. This is steam under pressure, so it's moist heat. An autoclave generates steam kind of like a pressure cooker would, and um, the extra pressure in there allows the temperature to go up higher than it would out in the open, like if you were boiling water on the stove. Boiling, so boiling water. Um, if you stick something into boiling water, it takes about 30 minutes to kill most non-spore forming pathogens. It's difficult to achieve full sterilization with boiling, but it is very useful for disinfection. And uh, you know, if you've had an infant at home, you've probably used boiling water to, to sterilize bottle nipples and things like that. Now what's pasteurization? So we hear about pasteurization. Um, pretty frequently, lots of liquids that you purchase in the grocery store are pasteurized, like apple juice and dairy products. And so what that is, um, a lot of times this is done in thin tubing. So they pass the liquid through a very thin piece of tubing and they flash heat it. So 71.6 Celsius for 15 seconds. And that's long enough. That doesn't, do you think that's going to achieve sterility? Hopefully you're thinking no, because some of these creatures, especially the endospores, are, are you know, they've got to be exposed to higher temperatures for longer periods of time to actually kill or inactivate them. But what this will do, pasteurization, will kill vegetative microorganisms and kills most pathogens that would be present in a, in a substance. So it makes, the pasteurization process makes it a lot safer. And they can also do it in batches where they'll expose liquids at 63 to 66 Celsius for about 30 minutes. So when you hear about pasteurization, that's that's what's happening. Pasteurization does not mean sterilization. So when you buy pasteurized milk, it is not sterile, but it is much more likely to not have pathogens than unpasteurized milk or apple juice or anything like that would, would have. All right, so uh, a little bit more about autoclave. So this is a picture over here of an autoclave. This is a diagram showing the inside of a autoclave. So these are chambers that you actually stick things in. There are lots of different sizes. So some can be about the size of a, a really small ones like dental, dentist offices may have ones that are not much bigger than say a convection oven like you might have a little tabletop convection oven you might have at home. Um, here in our lab at Calhoun we have kind of a mid-sized autoclave. Then you go into hospital settings and they'll have big gigantic ones embedded in the walls that you can put tons of stuff in all at the same time because a lot of medical waste, biohazardous waste, has to be autoclaved before it's released from a medical facility. So there are lots of different sizes. There's a chamber and it forms a tight seal when you close the door. There's a rubber gasket there and you put water into it and as it heats up the water starts to boil. That generates steam and the steam pressurizes. So the pressure inside that autoclave goes up to about 15 pounds per square inch above what you have out in the open air, the open atmosphere. And um, as that happens, when you have the higher pressure, 
water can actually achieve a higher temperature than it can out here in the open. So if you're boiling water on the stove, that water can heat up to 100 degrees Celsius. That's your maximum temperature. That's 212 Fahrenheit. But in an autoclave, uh, with 15 pounds per square inch of pressure above your atmospheric pressure, you can heat that water up to 121 Celsius. So we just saw how how um, how much shorter your exposure time can be with just a little bit of jump in temperature. Okay, so what that means, when you have things inside the autoclave and, and they're heating up to 121 degrees Celsius with 15 pound PSI of additional pressure, microorganism sterility can generally be achieved in about 10 minutes if you have a small volume. Now, if you've got tons of stuff jam-packed in the autoclave, you may have to have a longer exposure time before you can feel uh, confident that sterility has occurred. A lot of labs for fairly small batches of things in the autoclave will use 15 minute exposure times to achieve that. So that was just a little bit more about autoclaves. You guys will, you know, if you're working in healthcare, you're going to see those being used pretty frequently. What are some examples of dry heat methods? So there are hot air ovens that circulate hot air, basically convection ovens. And those have to go heat up to about 150 to 180 Celsius, two to four hour exposure times to achieve sterility. So there are some things that can't tolerate moisture. So you put them into, you might be able to put them into a hot air oven. Now some things can't tolerate high temperatures at all. So you're going to have to have other methods of achieving sterility in those cases. In a lot of cases that's going to get maybe into using some sort of chemical germicide to achieve sterility if that's necessary. Incineration, so lots of incineration goes on in laboratories and medical facilities. The heating of the inoculation loops that you guys have done in the virtual labs, that's an example of incineration. Uh, and there are incinerators in, in medical facilities as well. Very, very high temperatures, hundreds and hundreds or over a thousand degrees Celsius. And so everything just gets burned up basically. And, and uh, so it's obvious that we're going to be killing microbes in those cases. All right. Now on the flip side, what about cold temperatures? What I want you two guys to keep in mind, cold temperatures generally don't, you don't sterilize with cold temperatures. You may reduce the number of microbes you're slowing down or preventing the growth of almost all microorganisms, and especially pathogens, uh, microbes that are adapted to living in the human body at 37 degrees Celsius are not going to grow well in most cases in a refrigerator. So um, cold temperatures tend to be germostatic instead of germicidal. So keep that in mind. Refrigeration and freezing. This is more about control. Preventing the overgrowth of microorganisms, inhibiting their growth. Refrigerators, temperatures about 0 to 7 Celsius, 32 to 45 Fahrenheit. It's going to slow down the metabolisms of most, most microorganisms. Freezing is below zero Celsius, below 32 Fahrenheit. And there you're really putting things into a state of suspended animation. But again, you're not killing all microorganisms. Now, some microorganisms will be killed by the freezing and thawing processes that damages cell membranes, but not all. And, you know, endospores are not going to be killed by that. So don't think that freezing something is, is sterilizing. Uh, now, don't forget about those psychrophiles. Remember the psychrotrophs we talked about as well back in Chapter 6? Psychrophiles are cold-loving microorganisms. Psychrotrophs are microorganisms that um, maybe prefer more middle-range temperatures like the human body, but can still grow anyway under cold conditions. And those can be problems for uh, food spoilage and food safety in some, uh, in some instances. And a good example of a psychrotroph, Listeria, Listeria monocytogenes. We hear about this quite a bit in the news. Uh, I'm making this video in 2015, and there recently was a big Listeria outbreak in Blue Bell ice cream. And unfortunately, if that bacteria gets into a, a product, uh, it's still able to, to grow and survive in cold temperatures. 
Now, ice cream under refrigeration, I don't think the listeria was growing, so it must have been in there in pretty substantial numbers to trigger a, a recall. But you know, things like spinach over here in March of 2015, there was a spinach recall due to listeria. And so you can have refrigerated spinach with this listeria bacteria in it, and listeria can cause an illness known as listeriosis in, in humans. And um, that bacteria can still grow under refrigeration conditions, so that can cause problems with, uh, with produce. Or maybe you've heard before that pregnant women are not supposed to eat cold cuts and hot dogs. I may have talked about this back in Chapter 6. I'm, I'm forgetting what I've talked about on these videos versus my uh, traditional face-to-face -face classes. But uh, um, you know how you hear pregnant women are not supposed to eat like cold hot dogs, for example. Make sure they're cooked before you eat it. And listeria is one of the main organisms of concerns because, because it gets into any kind of, it can get into various agricultural products like meats, for example. And um, if it's in there, it can still multiply and build up to higher numbers in the refrigerator. And people with weakened immunity, including pregnant women, are more likely to develop an infection with listeria. If you're healthy, you're probably not going to develop listeria. Not that pregnant women aren't healthy, but they have weaker immunity. If you have normal immunity, you are probably not going to develop a listeria infection. If you get exposed to it, your immune system will take care of it and wipe it out before it can make you sick. All right, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and cut this video clip off there. In the next video, we'll talk about the other physical control methods before moving on to the, the chemical disinfectants and antiseptics.